that's an incredibly powerful video. Can you just share with us why, why you think um, what your father stood for 50 years ago and everything that was in that message is relevant today and why none of us should stand aside? Well, you know, I think, first of all, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, and thank you, thank you for coming and uh, your interest today. And I'm, I think it's a particularly appropriate that we follow the last two sessions. Um, you know, my father uh, ran for president at a moment of enormous division in our country and around the world. And I don't think there's been any time in the last 50 years since we've seen that kind of division. And I think that division is driven by one thing, and it's division by, by it's uh, driven by hate. It's, it's uh, driven by anger and fear and justice and hate. And that's Boko Haram in, in Nigeria, it's ISIS in Iraq and Syria, it's Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and uh, anti-immigrant sentiment here in Europe. Um, it's the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar. It's attacking women, femicide. It's the rise of the continuation of slavery around the world. Um, and the United States, it's the rise of Donald Trump and everything he stands for. Yeah. And uh, the only way we're going to end that division is, um, is by holding the perpetrators of it responsible for their actions. And that's what we do at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Uh, so since, since 1968, the organization has, has existed. And could you just talk us through how you take those, uh, those images and those words like compassion and dignity, which your dad used so much and is, which is missing from so much of politics today, to, to develop programs that are relevant for 2018 and beyond? So um, yeah, when daddy ran for president, he said, Justice and peace and compassion towards those who suffer. That's what the United States should stand for. And that's what I'll do if I'm elected president of the United States. Imagine a politician running for mm. office today saying justice, peace, and compassion towards those who suffer. So that's really our motivating force. So we do this in three ways. Number one, we hold governments accountable for human rights abuses. And we do that through litigation and advocacy. So when uh, Uganda passed a law that made homosexuality punishable by life in prison without parole, we sued them. We overturned that law. Um, you have, uh, what is it called, the something rush? The wind rush. The wind rush generation. The, almost the exact same thing that happened with wind rush here happened in the Dominican Republic. Um, and uh, where they overnight, informed 15% of their population who were Dominicans of Haitian descent that even though they had been there for four generations, they were no longer citizens. And since they weren't citizens, they had overnight no access to education, no access to health care, and would all be deported back to Haiti where they came from four generations ago. And um, so we sued them and, and we stopped that process it's still going on today but you know we stopped the worst of it um, so that's one thing but today of the hundred largest economies on earth 50 percent of them are corporations so if you're interested in human rights and you're not involved with corporate social responsibility you're missing it altogether and so um, we work with the investors in corporations to stop human rights abuses so in other words, usually when you think of a supply chain, you think of it going from the person, the lowest person on the factory line up to the CEO. But we think of it as going beyond the CEO to the private equity company that's investing in that company and then to the pension funds that are funding that private equity company. Those pension funds are investing the pensions for people on the lowest part of that supply chain for the people in the factories. So those people in the factory actually have much more power than they realize. And so we work on those issues, which I could explain a little more. And then if you hold the governments responsible and the, the companies responsible and they do everything they're supposed to do, it'll be for naught if you don't get the next generation involved. So we uh, teach and train 
the next generation of human rights defenders, kindergarten through law school, to 1.2 million students per year all around the world. And thanks to you, Paul, we've started this here in London. We have 12 schools here. And, um, and tell me how many we're going to have in the next few years. We're going to have 20,000 kids over the next three years go through our program. But that's an interesting, you know, it's easy for us to think sitting here in London, in the UK, that human rights is issues elsewhere. So it's really interesting to understand from your perspective why the UK, what, why are we going to work with the against the government, I guess, or, or, or challenge the government and businesses and work in schools, um, specifically here in the UK at this time? Well, I think, you know, if you walk, let, let me use the US, but I think it applies here as well. If you go into any high school in my country, um, any public high school, you will see the words, you'll see hate speech everywhere. You'll see bitch or witch, or, and you'll see um, faggot, and you'll see retard, and then you'll see everything else that you can imagine. And, um, and so kids are confronted every day, maybe 20, and then if you look online, they're getting it more and more and more. So they're confronted 20 or 30 times a day with this kind of hatred, and they have to decide what they're gonna do. Are they going to go along with it, or are they gonna stand up to their friends and say this is not okay? And each time they make that decision, it's like exercising a muscle. So they're exercising either the go along the mu muscle or the stand up muscle. And so if you do that 30 times a day for the, your entire middle school and then your entire high school, at the end of that, that becomes your go-to muscle. You don't even think about it. You know what you're supposed to do. Your body's reacting. And so what we want to do is build a uh, students, you know, a generation of students who whenever they confront hate speech or um, or it's, uh, disrespect of one another or a lack of humanity, just of compassion, that they know what they do. They, they stand up to that. And they have the tools and they feel comfortable. So humanity is a very interesting word there in terms of uh, our society in general and how it's perceived to be dehumanized. And if we think where we are today, city, heart of the city of London at Bloomberg, uh, we were at the London Stock Exchange this morning. Um, how are we going to influence the way businesses operate? Uh, we've got a conference that will be here next year where we'll look at alpha and how businesses can maximize their prosperity and opportunity, but also how they can recognize the issue of human rights. And, and, and I wonder if you could just share the, the sort of areas within the human rights field within the S of ESG that we're going to uh, address. So, so we really look at three different areas. So the first is um, supply chain issues. As you can imagine, what are those corporations doing on their supply chains? The second is my father was very involved. And so the second is who's making the investments. My father was very involved in the integration of the University of Mississippi and the University of Alabama. Most universities are pretty integrated today, except when it comes to investing their endowments. Investing their endowments, they're not integrated at all. So the 30 largest um, endowments in the United States and US uh, U.S. schools um, have less than 1.1% of their endowments invested by women or minority-owned firms. And let me be clear about this. This is not investments in companies that are run by women or minorities. These are the people who are taking the endowment money and investing it on behalf of that school. So 99% of them are old white men. This is worse than apartheid. This is worse than Alabama in 1956. I mean, in terms of that particular statistic. And nobody's talking about it. So, so and then university endowments, it's, this is across the board in all investment areas. So we're looking at that. And then the third area is in the tech, tech arena. How do you protect privacy, which all of you know, everybody's talking about. But, doesn't really help you if you only protect privacy. You have to protect privacy, right to information, and right to free expression. So those that troika in the tech world. And I think you know you could have spent a whole day talking about that very relevant subject. Um, 
I know the next session is specifically about diversity, so that's probably a great place for us to stop. Uh, thank you for uh, the work that you've done. Thank you for bringing it to the UK, and thank you for being here today. A round of applause for Kerry. Thank you.